Okay, so we'll be talking tonight about infertility. When we look at infertility, um, it's become one of the biggest concerns, I believe, in America. And there are several reasons for infertility. One of the primary things that we have to look at is 51 to 52%, depending on the studies you look at, of infertility is actually caused by not the woman, but the man. Okay? In America right now, the majority of men actually have a sperm count that is less than 12%. And anything technically under 30% is really infertility, or excuse me, is uh, considered sterility. But many men right now are under 12%. 18% is considered still really viable, but most men in America right now are under 12%. Okay? We'll talk about some reasons for that. When we look at female infertility, one of the primary issues that we're looking at has to do with, again, some type of a change in hormones. And when we talk about hormones, oftentimes we're talking about something called syndrome X, metabolic syndrome, or something called PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome. All of these kind of fall into a category that commonly is treated as insulin resistance, which basically is like a type 2 diabetic presentation. Okay, so even though the blood sugars necessarily aren't off, there is an insulin resistance that creates then a blood sugar imbalance. And blood sugar imbalances, as we've reviewed in several of our other classes, really has to do with an adrenal stress. And adrenal stress syndromes actually then will create hormonal imbalances for our systems. Okay? Remember when we're trying to recover adrenals, there are four deal breakers to recovering adrenal function. The primary one being anemia. How many young ladies do you know that have an anemia or an anemic problem? Those are very, very common, right? So anemia is our primary deal breaker. Number two, blood sugar dysregulation or blood sugar imbalances are deal breakers for recovering adrenals. And all of these syndromes are blood sugar modulation imbalances. Okay? The third thing that we look at as deal breakers are infections in the GI system. And then finally, allergies and primarily food allergens and the one that we see most commonly, again, is gluten. Because of its concomitant antibody reaction that creates an autoimmune thyroid. So hypothyroidism is the other thing that we look at with infertility in the female. Okay? So we really go off on this about female. Again, but what about male and what causes this low sperm count? Okay? When we look in the male, again, it is nutritional, is a primary one. And when we look at the young men today, especially, when we look at adrenal stressors, one of the primary adrenal stressors that we see is caffeine consumption. So all these guys that are doing the energy drinks and the Mountain Dews and those types of beverages are really stressing more their adrenal system and taxing then their body's own ability to increase or produce testosterone. Okay? The other thing that we look at is sugar. Overexercise and lack of sleep. So a lack of sleep or lack of rest. Hi, welcome. So these are really the primary male things that we're looking for. These are the areas that we want to look for in the female. Okay. Now, as we look at this, let's go back then to a couple of keys associated with anatomy. And some of the things that we look for in fertility and infertility in both males and females. Okay. Just, let's just go with a quick cap again. For males with infertility, 51 to 52% of males or the problem in infertility is actually the male side. So the majority of problems, first we look at the male side. Again, 18%, they're actually considering of sperm counts as viable. They're still saying it is actually considered fertile. 
but the majority of men have a sperm count that's less than 12%. Okay? Nutritionally, we see a primary driver to this that impairs it. Caffeine, sugar, overexercise, and lack of sleep being the primary drivers in the male for reducing that testosterone production and adrenal stress. In the female, we look at hormonal imbalances. And when we look at those hormonal imbalances, we're looking at syndrome X, metabolic syndrome, PCOS, and insulin resistance, which all are then adrenal stressors. And those deal breakers for recovering the adrenals then are anemia, blood sugar, infections, and allergens. Okay? And primarily food allergens then, with gluten being the most common food allergen that we're looking at because of its autoimmune antibody production that attacks the thyroid and causes a condition called Hashimoto's hypothyroidism. Okay. Any questions to that point? A lot of information. Okay, we're good. Be able to get that. Okay. Let me erase that section there. So let's go then to a couple of things associated with anatomy and some different things that we start to look at in the body <clears throat> from both a physical aspect of infertility and then also a relationship of uh, Chinese medicine. Looks like I had some young artists working on my board this last week. In the system, when we look at the female reproductive system, basically we have two little walnuts, if you will, almonds really, that are unshelled, called the ovaries, that then are cradled by little finger-like appendages called fimbrae that go into what are called the fallopian tubes. Fallopian tubes then join the top here, and enter the uterus, and then the uterus itself ends at what's called the cervix, and then out through the vaginal canal. When we look at this from a straight on point perspective, it's kind of deceiving in that when you look at it from a lateral point of view, the cervix actually faces slightly posteriorly, the, uterine, the uterus itself is a muscle. And so a lot of people have heard of conditions like endometriosis, okay? Anybody ever heard of endometriosis? Okay. Endometriosis very commonly occurs in the female when the inner lining of the uterus doesn't slough off and escape, but actually goes back up the fallopian tube and then implants somewhere in the peritoneal cavity or on the colon or on the bladder, which is out in front, or somewhere in that peritoneal cavity. And the hallmark sign of endometriosis in the female is brown blood as the show or beginning of my period. So hallmark of endometriosis is a brown blood before my actual menstrual flow. Okay? So that's one of the first things we always look for. With your menstrual flow, does it start red or does it spot brown? Does it start true bright red, or is it kind of a chocolatey, brownish color first? And if it's brown blood, it's a hallmark for endometriosis, okay? The other thing that may be linked to spotting, sometimes brown blood can be PCOS also. But according to <clears throat> Dr. Angela Highwood, a naturopath in Australia, uh, who specializes in fertility, she says hallmark brown blood endometriosis, and we found that to be very, very consistent. Okay? So let's just talk about again the anatomy here. The endometrium is this inner line, that's why it's endo or inside. The myometrium is the muscular layer outside of that that actually then, once fertility occurs, 
that is what causes the contraction. So those are the Braxton Hicks and then the actual muscular contractions is the myometrium, which refers to the muscle. Okay? And then on the outside of the uterus, of course, is the ectometrium, the outside layer or lining, okay, or surface of the covering. When we look at this then, this area is very, very active in its cell replication. And so a lot of females will start to develop later on what are called uterine fibroids. And those fibroids will start to be large tissue masses, fibrous tissue masses, will start to grow in the uterus and be sensitive to estrogen dominance. Okay? A lot of times what we'll see with uterine fibroids is concomitant then with uterine fibroids will be blood clots with my menstrual flow, okay, which is estrogen dominance. We'll see uterine fibroids, blood clots, and then we see gallbladder, I'll just put it as GB, stones, and gallbladder attacks, and then breast tenderness anytime after or during ovulation. So it can be ovulation to anytime during uh, the week before my period. So sometimes we'll see that as the PMS, premenstrual syndromes. Okay? So again, you can see how it can become a little more complicated or complex. This uterus, the cervix should actually be pointing slightly inferior and posteriorly. Okay? If it's not, so this is the vaginal vault back here like this, if it's forced too posteriorly, then it will actually cause back pain. Okay? And then we have a posterior facing cervix, which means that if we do get pregnant, baby ends up being delivered into the back or into the sacrum, the spine, and doesn't actually allow the birth canal to align so it actually delivers. We actually just deliver into the back and that's where we'll hear the, the concept of a lack of effacement and dilation. So you'll see a girl will come in, she'll say, I'm, I'm dilated, I've got intense contractions, they're coming closer and closer, and I labored for 10, 12, 14 hours, but never progressed past three or four, we we're stuck, okay? And that's literally what's happening is because the cervix is posterior facing, they don't actually progress and actually then are able to deliver correctly, okay? And that actually can be associated then with a pelvic imbalance. So if the pelvis itself, out here in the front, <clears throat> the pelvis is the pubic bones, and then the pelvis itself comes up around the sides this way, and then the femur heads come into these bones here and drop down. If the pelvis is torqued, it can cause a tippering, tipping and then a posterior translation of that cervix so that it's actually posterior facing and sometimes we can correct that pelvis and actually help to restore that. In some studies they've actually shown that a fractured tailbone is the link to endometriosis because of the change in the sacral plexus of nerves causing the myometrium instead of squeezing down the endometrium to flow out, it actually causes it to go retrograde or back up, causing endometriosis. So a broken tailbone may be a link to our infertility due to a potential cause of endometriosis or inappropriate innervation to the uterus. Okay? So that may be a, a very common problem that we see as well. And again, this, and when we look at the pelvis misalignments, those are very, very easily corrected and very, very easily assessed, right? Once we figure out how to fix them, we can teach your husband how to fix that, right? Okay, so the next thing that we look at is, with respect to this canal, and again, these tissues, if there's been a history of dysplasia, cervical dysplasia, or a positive pap smear, we may be looking at something to do with either a virus, which HPV, human papillomavirus, is very common, but a positive pap with just dysplasia 
can actually be treated by using folic acid in a high dose. Okay? And uh, Biotics makes a really nice product that we've had a lot of people with a history of positive PAPs corrected by using uh, Folate 5 Plus. And that's the name of the product. It's excellent. So cervical dysplasia may actually create, though, for us an immune reaction that doesn't allow the cervix to actually open or dilate correctly. Okay? So remember, the cervix itself is an opening about the size of a pin. Okay? It looks like that, basically. Okay? And it's very, very tight. In order for it to actually vasodilate, it actually has erectile tissue, and it has to have endothelial and nitrous oxide synthase, or enos, to be released in the arteries to open that up. Vasodilatation, then, is dependent on enos, which is stimulated by L-arginine. And just like in the male with erectile dysfunction, there can actually be, then, potentially an opening of the cervical os, or a lack of that thereof, to be able to allow this to come out during menstrual flow, or to allow, then, the sperm to come up to create fertility, all right?